Welcome to a brief presentation on toddler nutrition. My name is Dr. Johnson and we're going to go through what are some tips as well as nutrients that are important for this life stage of toddlerhood. So let's briefly look at the definition of this particular life cycle stage. When we're looking at toddlers, we're talking about one to three year olds and preschoolers are three to five year olds. So when we're looking at toddlers of one to three years of age, what are some of the major differences between feeding an infant and feeding a toddler? So I want you to pause this video and I want you to write down what do you believe are the differences between feeding an infant and feeding a toddler. So if we look at developmentally, there's a huge change that even occurs in that first year of life. Specific to nutrition, infants are rapidly growing. Infants are going to triple their weight and double their height within the first 12 months of life. That is why they're eating around the clock. During infancy, you have the highest metabolic rate out of any life stage. For example, you need about 110 calories per kilogram compared to an adult needs about 25 calories per kilogram. Now we understand that an adult body size will be much larger than an infant, but it's just to show you that the demand is significantly high during this infancy life period. Infants also move from exclusively having breast milk or formula to then transitioning around six months of age to start introducing some of those iron fortified cereals, pureed fruits and vegetables, and then ultimately some minced meats towards the nine month phase. When we look at toddlers, we're starting to incorporate more foods because they have the motor skills developed in order for them to eat the solid foods. We also typically wean them off of breast milk or formula and we introduce them to cow's milk. Now, cow's milk is not introduced during that first year of life because their kidneys are not fully developed yet and they can't process the amount of minerals that are in the cow's milk. Therefore, it is not appropriate for infants to have any type of cow's milk during the first 12 years of, or 12 months of life. Toddlers start to naturally decrease their appetite because their growth slows. This can be a really challenging concept for caregivers because you went from feeding an infant around the clock to now toddlers who are not going to be eating much. So in the caregiver's mind, a lot of times what happens is they start to push food onto the toddler and kind of make deals with them, right? So, you know, eat three more bites, eat two more bites. And this is something that we want to try to move away from. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more. This is also the time of life where you're going to see significant food preferences begin to develop, which is another reason why more exposure to a variety of health-giving foods like fruits and vegetables is essential. Even when the toddler says that they don't like them, we want to constantly expose them to try to help them learn to like them. Nutrition is extremely important during the first three years of life. These are two brain scans of a three-year-old within the first 1,000 days. On the left is normal, and you can see that there's a lot of activity. It's a good size, whereas the picture on the right is a malnourished child. That is why a lot of programs are pushed into making sure that kids have adequate access to healthy nutrition and also just nutrition in general. Some of the public health programs are here. So these are governmental assistant programs that are trying to promote, promote nourishment for underserved children. So people who are living below the poverty level, they have access to these programs. Let's first start talking about SNAP, which is in the bottom left-hand corner. SNAP is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. SNAP frequently is referred to as food stamps. However, we don't call it food stamps anymore. It is now SNAP. 
SNAP provides nutrition assistance to any anybody, any age, any gender who is under the poverty level can qualify for SNAP. SNAP does not have any type of regulations on foods that you can or cannot buy with the exception of you cannot purchase ready-made food. For example, if you go into a grocery store and there's the hot bar and they have kind of the buffet food style where you can pick the foods that are ready to eat, SNAP will not cover that. However, SNAP will cover things like chips, soda, candy. This is something that we can debate. You can have your own decisions about it. However, I'll present two sides of the coin. One side that says SNAP should be more regulated has the argument because tax dollars pay for the SNAP program and if the SNAP program you're able to buy what we would call unhealthy foods, so things like cake, cookie, candy, that then promotes things like type 2 diabetes, then if that person develops type 2 diabetes, they end up in the hospital for care, it's a higher amount of insurance, which is also paid by tax dollars. Therefore, people who are pro-regulating what is allowed to be purchased on SNAP has that particular argument that, well, my tax dollars are paying for this person to eat unhealthy, and then it causes them to get these diseases that are linked with nutrition. However, the other side of the coin where we would say we're against regulating what you can purchase with SNAP would argue that when we compare the foods that are being purchased with the SNAP program compared to the average general public, they're equivalent. So how is it ethical to regulate what they can and cannot purchase when it is the same thing that a standard American diet is following? Right now, one really fun loophole with the SNAP program, it's not really a loophole, but in Alaska, you can actually purchase a bow and arrow using the SNAP program because it helps them live off the land. Now let's talk about WIC. WIC stands for Women, Infant, and Children. This particular program is only allowed for women who are currently pregnant, who are six months postpartum, and I believe up to a year if they are breastfeeding. It also covers if a female has a miscarriage for up to six months after that. Any infant, either boy or girl, and then children ages five and younger, boy and girl. However, if you have a 10-year-old, let's say daughter or 10-year-old son, they would not qualify to use the WIC program. Let's look at this in another perspective. If you have a single dad and he has a one-year-old and a three-year-old that he is in charge of to take care of, the one-year-old and the three-year-old would qualify to use the WIC program, but the father would not. However, he could be on SNAP. So that's kind of a, a system that we're looking at because the overall health of a country, we look at how well the pregnancies are and the women, that is a marker of how healthy the actual population is. We push a lot of money into this particular population that is typically underserved as well as trying to promote adequate health and growing. WIC does have very strict requirements on what can and cannot be purchased with their program. For example, the next time you walk through the grocery store, look for this little WIC sign and you will see it. They really are pushing foods that children need to grow, things like iron fortified cereals, whereas you wouldn't be able to buy just the regular. They also push things like protein, so peanut butter is a really good source of protein for kids. Um, that they like to have and then as well as things like eggs and chicken and all that other nourishing foods. Now Head Start is a program for children um, preschooler three to five years of age that it is a comprehensive preschool that provides services like social work, uh, healthy nutrition, and then as well as other early development learning. One thing that's really cool about Head Start is that with their nutrition program, they actually do a family-style meal at lunchtime, 
And so the children are actually feeding themselves, maybe with the assistance of a TA in the room. And these foods are all meeting the requirements, again, that we are going to talk about later when we look at meal planning. Um, but Head Start is a really amazing program that starts to teach these children to have healthy foods that they like and enjoy from an early age. So how many calories do toddlers need? It's really going to vary based off their age as well as their gender. Um, so this is just a really quick kind of guide here. So let's look at a five-year-old boy and let's say they're relatively active. That five-year-old boy is going to need about 1,600 calories per day. That's a significant amount of calories. Some of you only need, as an adult, 1,600 calories per day. So it just shows that their bodies are still growing and they're super active, so they're going to require that energy to help them move around. Keep this in mind as we're starting to plan menus, as well as you start thinking about trying to get a child to eat adequate foods and how challenging that can be to meet their calorie requirement. When we look at protein, Protein is not necessarily the most important part of their diet, but it is an important role, but they need very minimal amounts. So for example, a one to three year old needs approximately 13 grams per day. To give you perspective, two eggs would be about 13 grams. And then at four to eight years old, they do increase it a little bit to about 19 grams per day. And the idea is to try to get 10 to 20% of their daily calories from protein. Now, when you start planning a menu, you will see that protein will exceed or go above the 13 grams per day. That is okay. It is going to happen. It is pretty much impossible to provide the child with all of their other nutrient needs without going over that protein. And that's more than okay as long as we're not going over their calorie intake too much because chronically going over their calories is then going to promote obesity. So how do we actually determine if that child is getting enough? So this is an important aspect and these are called the CDC growth charts. The pink one is for girls and the blue one is for boys. Essentially what we do is myself as a dietitian when a child would come into the clinic or maybe the, or also the physician does this when you go in for your checkups they plot them. Now when I was working clinical we had to actually plot this on a piece of paper but now we have these really great smart computers that do it for us. So here where the black lines are or I'm sorry the black dots though that would be three visits and this is a good trajectory of this particular child's length, so that means they're getting taller. What we don't want to see is if the dots go from this particular percentile, so this is about the oh, 15th percentile below the 25th percentile, if that dot goes up and then down and then up and then down, so we're seeing really sharp spikes and really sharp dips, that's telling us that there's some type of underlining problem that we need to make sure that we can address. So you want to see them kind of stay right nice along and go up this linear path here. That would be a good signal of growth. So when we are plotting kids and putting them into the categories for BMI, um, unlike where we have like a normal overweight obese we actually don't call children obese so when we plot them here so i'm going to give an example it's kind of hard to see on the screen here but let's say we plotted them and then we come up here and we get to see the percentile which is this number here if that child was plotted right here that means they're between the 50th and 75th percentile or slightly below the 75th percentile so what that means is that they would be normal. Um, we say that they're at risk of being overweight if they're between the 85th to 95th percentile. If they're above the 95th percentile, which would be over here, um, then that would be considered overweight. And then if they're below the 5th percentile, which would be on this blue part of the pattern, then they're going to be considered underweight. So this is something that we want to make sure that we can keep them in a healthy weight um, category because that shows long term kind of if they're going to be obese when they're an adult. So if we looked at a three-year-old boy and they have a BMI of 14, uh, if you do have a practice sheet, 
you can plot them and then classify and see where they fall. And then if we had a six-year-old boy and they had a BMI of 18, you could plot them and see where they are. So go ahead and pause the video. Uh, maybe you can find a program online where you plug in those numbers and see what percentile they would fall under. So moving on here with toddlers and preschoolers, when we look at their developmental aspects, they're starting to seek a lot more independence. They want to do things on their own. They like to explore the environment, and undernutrition really impairs their cognitive development. So we need to make sure that we can meet them with that independence and meet them with exploring that environment. One of the ways in which we can do that is having food to play with. And I know that goes against what at least I was taught as a child, that I don't play with food. However, this is a really good part of their sensory integration development. And then they get exposed to these different textures of food and they can start trying to maybe experience different items that they were unfamiliar with previously. So toddlers are messy. As anyone knows who's fed children before, you know it can get very messy. This is obviously an extreme, but it happens. And so we want to be able to figure out how we can meet them where they're at. Again, I'm going to emphasize this, that we really want to remember that they have a natural decrease of interest in food due to their slowing growth rate. So feeding can become challenging, and we want to make sure that we understand this for several reasons. They're easily distracted during mealtimes, so it's best to not have them watching an iPad or watching TV. We really want them to focus on feeding. So what are some of those behaviors that we're going to be seeing during this life cycle? They demonstrate really strong food preferences and dislikes. New foods are better accepted if the child is hungry. And it's a monkey see, monkey do. So if you are trying to get that child to eat fruits and vegetables and you personally don't eat fruits and vegetables, they're going to notice that. And so this is why it's really important to make mealtime a family time. Um, as well as help getting everybody involved, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Mealtime is essential for the overall growth and development of a child. Mealtime provides lots of opportunities for the child to practice language skills, social skills, it develops positive self-image, and it is a not a time for force feeding. So this is one aspect, the last bullet point, that Ellen Sater is one of the gurus on how to feed your child not too much and not too little. Her website is full of healthy tips for care providers in order to make sure that the child is adequately fueled um, and developing a really good relationship with their food. So if we force a child to eat, especially during this time frame when they naturally have a decreased appetite because they're not growing, what can happen is we can be promoting obesity long term. Children are natural intuitive eaters. So what that means is they only eat when they're hungry. And if they're not hungry, they're not going to eat. Unlike us as adults who are eating food based off of maybe our schedule, out of boredom, out of stress, children don't do that yet. And so we don't want to teach that by forcing them to finish the food on their plate. If they're not hungry, they're done eating. We might negotiate with them in regards to letting them know, if you are done, we are not going to be coming back, so make sure that you are full. And if you're, or on the other side, if they ask for second servings, but they've already had quite a bit of food, we can say, let's go play for 30 minutes. If you're still hungry, then we can come back and have another snack. This is important because we don't want to teach the children to not be able to feel what full feels like and then be able to feel what hunger feels like, right? Because naturally, most of us don't go by our hunger full hormones and feelings anymore, but children do. So when we look at toddler food intake, the, there are specific serving sizes that are better to look at the actual template on the menu. In general, it's about one tablespoon of food per age. So for example, if, a two -year -old, if the child's two, then they would get two tablespoons of the different food groups. It's better to actually have the child serve themselves than you serve them. Why do you think that may be? Well, 
adults are going to give adult sized portions typically. Kids actually know what their portion should be a little bit more intuitively than adults do. So it's best to have them control the portion. So we want the child to make um, their own portions. They can ask for more. Snacks during this time frame are really important due to the smaller size. If you remember that five-year-old active boy needs about 1,600 calories per day. We can't physically meet that in just three meals throughout the day. This is why snacks are important. Snacks should not be what we would call energy-dense foods. Energy-dense foods would be things like straight fruit juice, uh, lemonade, soda, cookies, cake, because those are just empty calories with not a lot of nutrition in them. It's okay to have them occasionally, but we don't want them to be an everyday occurrence with their snacks, and we shouldn't let them graze on those energy-dense foods. We really want to focus on trying to have snacks that are nourishing dense. Things like ants on a log, that's celery, peanut butter, and then raisins that don't have any added sugars in it. That would be a great snack for this time frame. So some nutrients of concerns for this life stage. The big ones are iron, calcium, zinc, and fiber. So what I want you to do is pause the video I want you to think and write out what are the main functions of iron, calcium, zinc, and fiber, and then provide at least three to four food sources for those nutrients, because this will come in handy when you start planning menus, and if the child is low on iron, once you analyze it, you are able to actually remember what foods contain iron. So one thing we want to do is use the menu templates to make sure that we are providing the menus that are going to be giving the different nutrients for that child in that life stage. And we want to make sure that they're getting enough. We have to again remember that preschoolers have the ability to self-regulate food intake. They will eat when they're hungry. They will stop when they're full. So they're learning this very healthful behavior and making these choices. So we really want to make sure that we listen to that preschooler. They may go three, four, or five days without eating a lot of food, but they'll make it up in the later days. Picky eating is something that we can address. A lot of preschoolers are going to experience this, so what are some techniques that we can use? One of them is by making food fun. We can create these fun little like skeleton vegetables. We can have them choose. The studies show that when a child feels that they have choice, they're actually more likely to eat that vegetable. So if we ask, um, we can say, would you prefer carrots or would you prefer cucumbers? And if they say carrots, then we know that they're more likely to actually eat that carrot versus just saying, here's cucumbers, eat your vegetables. So which foods do kids prefer? Typically the crackers, the salty, um, not off fruit, so like right, they like the sweeter flavors. Um, they like the crunchy, salty kind of foods. So this is something that we can really focus on trying to pair some foods. So if they're going to try a new food, we actually don't want to offer their favorite food with the new food. And then again, it's best to offer that new food when they're hungry. So these are, you know, kind of common things where kids really like simple foods. They like room temperature, nothing too hot, nothing too cold, maybe unless it's ice cream, right? Um, they like bite-sized foods. They like their colorful plates and chunks, things that are easy to grasp with their fingers, and you're going to see a lot of strong food preferences develop. It's important, though, that even if a kid says they don't like broccoli, they don't like broccoli, to continue to expose them to broccoli. Maybe it's doing a craft and they're the trees at mealtime. And then the next time, maybe they just lick the top of the tree um, just to start to get them exposed. And then hopefully, eventually, they do actually try that broccoli and they might actually see they like it. It takes about 10 to 15 times for someone to not 
or decide that they don't like a food. So it's important to have that continued exposure to increase the variety of foods that the child is eating. So other factors that influence children's eating behaviors. So I want you to think about this. Who has the most influence on a child's attitude towards food and food choices during this lifespan? And then I want you to pause and think and plan about some other influences. So it actually shows that the number one influencer is going to be siblings and then parents. So this is an important aspect to consider because that goes back to the monkey see, monkey do. So we want to model eating healthy if we want our children to eat healthy. So what are some other influences on food choices? Pause the video and write those down. If you have marketing, it is 100% true. Companies pay a lot of money in order to have a particular food, a particular food on that menu, or sorry, on that shelf that is within eyesight of the child. So when we're looking at grocery stores, the items that are on the shelves and the very bottom rack and then the items on the shelves at the very top are going to be the ones that are typically a little bit healthier. The ones right in the middle tend to have a lot of added fats and added sugars in it and those are typically going to have a lot of marketing messages with kid characters in order to grab the attention because what happens? That kid sees that cartoon character that they love so much. They want that sugary food and then mom and dad or care provider says, I'm sorry, no. And what happens? Child throws a tantrum. And then in the middle of the grocery store, you have this kid throwing a fit. So what happens? Mom, dad, care provider cave because they want that child to stop crying. So they just end up buying that sugary food. Again, companies pay millions of dollars on marketing and advertising and product placement inside the grocery store. And in fact... The um, Public Health Advocacy Institute says that kids don't have the ability to recognize the intent of this advertising, and that blurs the line with the popular characters and not-so-healthy foods. So Disney is doing this really cool initiative that they're working on to where they're going to be putting on what we would call kind of kid food, so things like fruit snacks. Um, they're going to be putting a check if like a Mickey check if the foods are under a certain amount of calories, saturated fat, sodium, and added sugars to help parents make a little bit more informed decisions. But right now, that's not fully developed um, because it is very confusing and misleading because a lot of the products that have kid characters are not as healthy as, let's just say, a plain fruit and vegetable. So we need to remember during this time frame that toddlers move along slowly and it can be very frustrating for the care provider. However, it is important to continue to expose them to a variety of nourishing foods because this can help them develop that relationship with food in a positive manner and also be confident in making those choices of choosing healthier food items. It's important to remember that children offered should not be offered food if they're feeling upset because we don't want them to learn that food can be a quick band-aid for a sad day, a stressed day. If you're angry, um, that's not how we want to use food. I always kind of tell people we're not dogs, so we shouldn't get food for rewards. We should try to be looking at other options to uplift their feelings. Maybe it's going for a walk or maybe it's going to the beach sitting down and talking about what's going on instead of just, here, have this cookie, it'll make you feel better. We also don't want to force them to eat food because this is when they get turned off by food. And we want to try to stick to structured meal and snack times because that helps them create that routine. I want you to pause the video and based off of everything that we have been talking about during this lecture, I want you to write some bullet points and draw some pictures to help teach parents how to feed toddlers.
So the adult's role during this um, to help children to learn to like a variety of nourishing foods by serving a wide variety of foods, providing repeated opportunities to sample nutritious foods, making mealtimes relaxed and cheerful, being a positive role model, allowing them to eat with their fingers and slowly master utensils and cup skills. So let's look at some ways that we can get kids involved in the kitchen. So again, I want you to pause this and brainstorm appropriate activities for a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, and a five-year-old. How might you get them involved in the process of mealtime? The more you can get them involved in the process, the more likely they are to try these foods. Here are some examples. A two-year-old can tear lettuce or rinse produce. A three-year-old can mash potatoes, stir pancake mix. A four-year-old can peel fruit, toss a salad. A five-year-old can measure liquids and cut soft fruit with a kid-approved knife. So the next time you're cooking in the kitchen, think about these activities if you're with kids on how they can get involved in the process. I know it takes a little bit of time, but it helps develop that confidence in the kitchen and also gets them to be exposed to a variety of nourishing foods. It's important to remember that calorie needs decrease after the first year of life. They're going to eat less food. They will not be as hungry as often. And calorie needs are met by averaging eating over several days. Adults need to remember that I better eat now so I won't be hungry later. We have that fixed mindset as adults because we understand that in four hours I'm going to be working and I'm unable to eat. Where a child in the moment says I'm not hungry so they're not going to be eating. We want to offer regular nu nutritious meals and snacks uh, that will help them meet their needs. Again, remember, it's a process, it's a journey, and it's something that we want to try to encourage this early eating behaviors so that they develop lifelong confidence in choosing nourishing foods and listening to their hungerful hormones.